presentation. Uh, my name is Madhu Kanur. I'm actually with the Automate team. Uh, I joined uh, Red Hat uh, this January, and I've been primarily working on uh, enhancing the Automate uh, uh, product inside of, uh, inside of the Manage IQ. So the agenda for today is uh, you know, I'll give you some of the background on what Automate means, because I people, when you hear the word Automate, they typically think it's automating maybe testing or something like that, but uh, Automate has a slightly different meaning in our context. Some of the recent changes that we have done uh, in the Anand release, and then the future plan for, you know, like what are the items that we're going to be adding in the next release of the product. And then in that we'll have a Q&A. I also have a small demo that I'll actually show in between, and uh, it's still wet. It's actually, there's a lot of uh, new things that we have to do, so I'll actually see how much of that works today. So Automate uh, is actually a, a Manage IQ tool set which is used to extend the product's capabilities out in the field. When you go to do an implementation, if a customer actually has a specific requirement, it is not baked into the product, you can actually use Automate to extend the capabilities of the product. The other thing is uh, a customer might actually have a day-to-day -day requirements that is specific to their, for example, you know, you want to add a hard drive to a virtual machine. So you could actually model that an entire thing and automate and uh, provide a button for the user to actually click on it and actually add a hard drive under the covers. So the user doesn't have to know all the processes that are happening and neither do we because I think uh, the way Automate is built is it actually abstracts away all the complications to the domain experts to be building these things uh, for the end user. So the other third thing is, you know, like uh, you can integrate uh, with other products through Automate. So most of the integration that happens, you know, like out of the field, um, you could actually use Automate to talk to other servers, collect information, and Know, pull in uh, certain specific informations into the workflow and drive the processes. So Automate basically uses uh, an object model and uh, the object model actually comprises of uh, domain, which is actually the highest level container. And then uh, under each domain, there are a bunch of namespaces and namespaces can have uh, multiple levels. And uh, at the end of the namespace, there is uh, typically classes. And uh, you can have one or more classes. And class names actually will divide across namespaces. And we have each class actually contains a schema. And a schema is basically a collection of uh, attributes, uh, methods, relationships, and assertions, which actually the domain experts actually use to build their model. And for us, when we process it, we actually just know that there is a, a class and an instance. We really don't know what the contents of those are. So it is entirely up to the guy who's building it or the designer who's building it, I think like, and if you watched uh, John Hardy's presentation yesterday, he was actually building a car with four doors using this. So that's how um, you know, abstracted we are from what's in the model. And uh, there are also methods in here because typically um, when you have uh, the object model, there, there needs to be some interaction with some other entity. So there is a method. And the methods typically today are written in Ruby. So you have a collection of instances and methods at the leaf nodes of this uh, of <coughs> classes. And uh, one more thing that actually was implemented in uh, the Arnold release was actually uh, something called a domain search. And the reason this was actually added was uh, since uh, each domain is uh, specific to a particular customer or a specific uh, marketplace source that you would have gotten the data from, uh, we, want, we want to make sure that we don't step on each other's uh, the domain search was added, so if there is an instance that actually exists in multiple domains, uh, we would actually pick up the instance from the highest priority domain. So in this example here, um, we have, uh, there are two domains, 
one is the priority of 10 and the other one is the priority of 20. And uh, underneath the domain one, there is actually a namespace <coughs> one which actually has a class one and then there are two instances underneath it, instance one and instance two. In the domain two, which is actually a higher priority domain, there is a namespace, the same exact namespace which has a class and an instance. <coughs> and when we resolve this uh, during the automation process, most of the paths that we see, they are all uh, partially qualified, they are never fully qualified. And the reason they are actually never fully qualified is to take advantage of the domain search. So if you um, know how the search works in most of the operating systems, you would actually, it's the difference between searching and typing ls versus typing slash bin slash ls. So if you give a relative path, we actually search for the instance in multiple domains and the one that actually has the highest priority would get used. If you actually wanted it to be driven to a particular domain, you could actually just put a slash in front of it and just fully qualify it and then we would not do the domain search. So this actually allows us to you know, keep the domain separate but still allow uh, users to or actually customers to customize this model by creating a parallel domain to the higher priority and not mucking with our data. <laughs> Which actually allows for easier upgrades and stuff because I think as we add new features into our domain, we can actually just drop it <coughs> place without actually affecting customers' data. The automated mo object model today is actually stored in a relational database like PostgreSQL and there are six tables that actually store it which is basically the MIQA namespace, the MIQA classes, the MIQA instances, methods, fields, and values. Uh, in the previous slide, I didn't show the fields and values because uh, in the newer models that we have, the fields and values, they actually get consumed by the classes and instances. So we actually don't need to store them separately going forward. So the basic flow, is we actually have a Postgres database and uh, we have our Automate Explorer which is actually the UI that is responsible for reading and writing into the Postgres database helping the user or the designer create a model that actually is, you know, like shows uh, basically has all the classes and instances needed to solve their particular problem. And this actually is a read-write operation. And then we also have tools like the export and import tools that basically do the same read and write operation. And then there is actually the third component, which is actually the automate engine, which actually processes the model. And typically, uh, the automate engine does a read-only operation. I think there are cases where people have used the create instance facility to create instances, but typically that is discouraged. So this is the basic flow. And if you look at it, I think it, everything is actually going into Postgres SQL. So there were a lot of recent changes that we made in the fight out and the Anand release. And uh, the automate model actually was converted to a YAML format. And the reason for doing that was uh, in the earlier versions of the product, we actually used to have a single XML which used to have all of these uh, classes and instances uh, embedded inside. It was very difficult to actually you know, make changes. So what we did is we actually created uh, like a YAML format for the namespace, classes, and instances, and methods, and split them out. So now it is easier for somebody to actually change them. This uh, format is also used for uh, exporting models from the PostgreSQL and also importing models into PostgreSQL. And it is also used for restore and backup of the automated model. The other thing that was actually introduced was the domain concept. I think the domain concept was basically used to segregate the models from different vendors or different sources. And the manage IQ <coughs> model, which is of the manage IQ domain, which is what we ship by default with the manage IQ part it actually is a read-only domain. You actually cannot make changes to any of the classes or instances uh, in that domain. If the user actually wants to uh, make changes, he has to create a domain of his own 
and by default it actually gets uh, the highest priority so it will get used every time and uh, when you copy out the class, uh, the instance or the method, it actually copies out the classes and the namespaces, everything for you into a, into a private area where you can actually go and make changes. Uh, each domain is actually uh, stored in a separate uh, directory. And uh, today they are actually stored under VMDB, DB, fixtures, any data store. They all live as uh, separate directories. I think like if you, uh, we to look in that folder, as we add new domains, we'll actually create directories underneath it and put stuff in there. There's also uh, the instance and method overrides, which I just talked about in the previous slide. That is also new, and again, the reason that was added was for allowing customers to override our default methods and our default behaviors. So the future plan for Automate is, you know, like I mentioned, there is, uh, methods inside of Automate and typically the methods are Ruby methods and uh, the people that are actually working with it are the designers and uh, they would like to get version control just like you know we developers have version control. So if they make a change then something messes up they want to go back to a previous working state so that's actually a very uh, important feature so that you know we can revert back changes or you know like uh, keep track, uh, do an audit trail of uh, what are the changes that have been made. The other thing is uh, we're planning on adding uh, like REST API throughout the product. So one of the enhancements that we will plan for the future is uh, having REST API for automate methods. And the third item is actually separating out the automate engine as a Ruby gem or Rails engine. So the use cases uh, for uh, the version control for Automate is basically users would like to make incremental changes to the Automate model, revert back to previous state, <coughs> and the user edits are actually currently directly written to the database and it cannot be easily undone. You can undo it, but it's a painful process. Uh, since each domain is in a separate uh, directory now, you would actually export out the model every day and you know like as we make changes if you realize there's a mistake you can actually go back to one of the previous versions so by adding uh, this feature the version control you know we can actually alleviate some of the pains that the uh, the designers would have there's also the ability to do audit trails you can actually figure out who did what to the model so the proposal that we have is to actually use git to do the version control for the automate model and uh, the automate model actually would be stored as a Git repository. Uh, each domain would actually be its own little repository. And the automate engine would actually read from the model, uh, from, sorry, from the Git repository, and the MIT Automate Explorer will make changes to the automate model which will actually get saved by Git. So the read-write operations are gonna be, you know, like, Git would sit in between the read-write operation so you can actually get some of the benefits of version control and also the compression and stuff like that that's built into uh, Git where you would be able to save files because some of the YAML files you see they're pretty small they're like barely like hundreds of bytes of data so once we uh, actually go to the the Git and the file system based database, uh, there, you know, like definitely pros and cons. Uh, the Postgres actually had a lot of advantages, you know, it being a single database, it can be shared between multiple appliances, it had the ability to do transactions, backups, replications. But one thing that it actually lacks is, you know, the version control. The, the Git plus the file system database that we are, you know, planning on using in the future has uh, the, some of the pros are, you know, the version control, the history, ability to do changes, <laughs> share repositories. But some of the cons are, you know, there's another system to be managed for backup, replications, etc. So this is how we envision it working. So you would actually have multiple appliances in your environment. And in, in the middle, you actually have Postgres, which is being shared between all these appliances. Uh, in one of the appliances, we'll actually mark that as a Git master. So uh, that would be the one 
that would actually have all the read-write operations happening onto it. And then there would actually be other appliances in your environment which would actually work as, uh, you know, like secondary masters and also get slaves. So there are, in this environment, there are actually uh, four appliances, one being the get master, the other two being the get slaves, the third one, appliance three, is also a slave <coughs> as well as the secondary master. And the reason it's there is because in case appliance one were to go down for some reason, the secondary appliance can actually take over and become the master. The git master, which is actually this appliance one here, would have the ability to go out and fetch the external repositories, like say from manage IQ or from the marketplace, and make that available to all the other appliances in its environment. And once it has actually acquired uh, the different uh, external repositories, it actually have, you know, like, store them as separate domains. And if the customer were to, say, add uh, a new domain in the system, you know, it would actually create a Git repository and actually uh, start managing that. The, once uh, all the updates have been done into the Git master, it will actually upload some repository metadata into Postgres. <coughs> Since that's actually shared between the four appliances, it can actually keep track of you know what are the repositories that are available, um, and uh, if they are remote or if they are local, and you know like we can add additional stuff into it, like when it was last updated, what is the last commit, and things like that. So if an appliance need to sync up and get the latest Git repository, it would actually first go up to the Postgres database. It's you know, one option you know, we can do. We can actually directly do a git pull and git clone if need be. But uh, you know, one of the thoughts is you know we could actually go through Postgres, get all the information, and then once you have that information, you can actually do a clone or pull from the appliance one, which being since currently that would be the master that's in there in the environment, and then that's how you know the appliance two would get its update. And then the same thing would actually happen on the other appliances where you'd actually periodically get uh, updates from the, from the appliance one and just pull it down and you have the latest uh, information available for you on each of these appliances. Any questions so far? Or? So when you do a save to the, a model or something, would that also queue up a resync for all the other slaves? Because I assume that would make a commit on the master, right? Yeah, we could do that. I think like uh, it, it actually depends because uh, if uh, the git slave on say on this appliance, if there is already an automated worker running, you, know, you can't just go and update it. So one of the things that we were thinking of uh, was you know each uh, uh, automated worker would actually run with a commit shell. So if there are like if you know which of the different shards that are available, you know that's not going to be compromised with the time you're running. So even when you pulled it, you'd actually get a new commit shard. And you could have many different automated workers working at different shards. But I know how complicated that will become. So I think those are actually some of the issues uh, that we'd have to discuss. But it, would you be able to make a bunch of changes on the master and then say I want to commit those? Are you talking? That, that's again. Uh, and that, that'd be the best, right? I mean, a bunch of changes to different classes that all work together. Yes. Then I say I'm ready. Yes. So I think that should be, I think, configurable. Like, how uh, granular you want to be? Like, do you actually want to do it on a file by file basis, or do you actually want to do it uh, <coughs> for a certain number of transactions, or do you actually want to let the designer push that right. And So I think those are all. I think once we have the basic framework, I think like adding these sorts of controls on the top is actually going to be a lot easier. Right. What if um, the automated model was just up and fair to store binary data? Is this solution going to be future proof for um, it being able to do that by large you know, gigabytes worth of data? You Did mean for individual methods or you mean for domains? If it was, if it was to is that a real use case or is that a hypothetical? Hypothetical. Okay. Typically, you don't do that with Git because Git keeps the history forever. Okay. And if you were to upload a one Git file on the Git, 
and then make one tiny little change, you get a whole other gig file in history. So you have it twice. Um, so you want to avoid that. Typically, large file access like that is kind of held offline, and then you kind of refer to it <coughs> elsewhere. Right. Um, again, that's why I asked, is it a real use case or not? <laughs> well, I think the use case is valid. I just don't know whether you know, the use case, if you were to hyperlate it and say it's just going to be a software distribution store, and it's going to store packages, would we look at storing packages as part of Git, or would we actually create a new file store for that and proxy it off? So one thing, because we're at the Manage IQ, we have the binary blobs table. Mm -hmm. So we could potentially do something where you say store the binary blob in the database, and that could be any arbitrary size. Mm -hmm. And then that again, that's like an external store that you could refer to, right? right? So you, through the automate um, service model, you can say give me this binary blob from the Postgres database, right. and then you have it, right? Um, I guess that would depend on. Uh, it all depends. And we are actually not excluding anything. I think like everything is fair game because I think uh, down the road it's possible you might actually have a, a jar file sitting in there, you know, to support a Java method. Right? Mm -hmm. <coughs> if the UI worker is an appliance on a three, right. and the Git master is an appliance one, um, how would updates kind of work? Okay, so there, there are two <coughs> thoughts there. But the first thought being, you know, like uh, should uh, each of these appliances be allowed to do, you know. Uh, edits on the fly? Or should there be one designated appliance where you know you, all the edits happen on that appliance? So if you do it uh, where everything is shared, then you know you would actually be doing the git pull and then I think as soon as you make the commit, you'll actually do a git push up onto the master. So you'd always have, so if you made, uh, if this is actually in a multi-edit environment, you make changes here, you'd actually save the changes and then immediately do a push here and then all these other guys will have a pull it in and even he would have the latest update there. Wouldn't you have like merge conflict issues? It, 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 it is possible. Or yeah. both doing updates? Yeah, that is definitely possible. And I think like I'm not sure how much we can actually eliminate all of those uh, issues. <coughs> but I think like uh, if it's in a controlled environment, where, you know like uh, there are people who are the domain designers if they want to be, you know, like controlling it, they could control it. Otherwise, you know, it is possible that they would have to manually figure out you know, how these conflicts need to be resolved. So that's one of the things that Git does well, is if you make a change and there is a conflict, it'll tell you, right? So then once we know that there's a conflict on appliance three, we can perhaps auto-resolve it by doing a poll, a auto poll and see if we can do it. If we can't, then present that to the user and say, hey, you know, on the fly, something changed out from underneath you. Um, either present a diff or we block. I mean, there's a lot of approaches we can take from the UI level on how do we present that conflict to someone. Um, my, I don't know how often multiple people are changing automate models in the same space at the same time. Uh, is that like a common space? You, you, have to account for it. you do have to account for it, but I think Git will do most of the work for you, and I think that's the key here. I guess one question I have is, is, is there any performance consideration for moving it out of the database? Because the database is often convenient because all of them are point the same database. So if you have a master view repository and you use uh, Postman hooks, then that's what shows the change in the database. The rest of it doesn't have to change because they're all still pulling from the database. Are you talking about the reading from the file system issue? Or are you talking about uh, keeping them in sync? Well, uh, you have less. Right now, you don't have a problem keeping them in sync because they're all reading from the same database. Right. So, so if, if what you want is convenience to be able to place files because of Git, if somebody, if one of the appliances has the role as as the master for that operation, your check in and your interaction is with Git with it, and then you 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 say and there's a post commit hook that watches four changes on that and then shoves that in the database, and you don't have to do anything I think else. That last the other part ones. is the assumption that's wrong. There's no last shove it in the database. It just it's on disk and there is no database anymore. Well, Those MIQA tables wouldn't right. exist anymore. My, my, my question is, is, is why is, is, it, is it problematic performance-wise? Because you've got a single source of truth there. You've got to be talking to the database or you're not doing any of the other things you do. So well, well, the the with Madhu mentioned, which is kind of a big advantage over the Git approach, um, is that today without Git, just with Postgres, the automated model is in the database. So while one worker is doing resolution, it is possible, I don't know if you guys have run into it or not, um, for somebody with, with the UI to go in and update something while, while an automated resolution is happening. 
And so you're going to get to, you may get to an inconsistent state that way. With the Git approach, we can actually say to a, um, do an automate resolution for a particular URL using a particular Git SHA. Um, yeah. And so all, all of the, um, all, all of the automate worker has to know is that he has that git shot. If he doesn't, then he pulls from the master. Yeah. Otherwise, he'll, he's always going to have that particular git shot, and he knows that he's in a good place. That's, that's why I asked if there was mm -hmm. a, a performance or if there was some other yeah, The other thing is, even since the Postgres uh, sitting in between actually has the latest information, you know, you actually know when you're out of sync. Yeah, you just throw the shot there or something, right? Yes. You can. You don't really need to. Do that. <coughs> yes. That's one thing Git does well. Does well. Just do Git pull, and if you're out of sync, it'll make you in sync. So it, we thought it, we may want to put it there for reporting purposes. And say, like, here's all the domain repos, and here's their latest SHA. But that's really it. And I don't even know if you need that, because you can still go to Git to get the information. So with the, with the, two, with the um, using the Git SHA approach, even on a single appliance, you have two workers that want to have do two resolutions off of two different Git shards, is that possible? Yeah, because I think uh, internally, when we walk the tree, we are not walking the file system tree, we are actually walking the comment tree, which is stored oh, separately okay. by Git. And all those files, they are actually stored as compressed blobs and we can still have access to them. So, so, you, uh, so it's not on the file system? Technically, uh, technically, we don't technically, need technically file system. this can all be done with bare repos, and you don't need you don't need a checkout, right? Right. You don't you just it. ask Git, get me this file system tree for the shop, and just start walking it and get all the information you need that way. Um, using Rugged. Yeah. Using Rugged? Yeah, that's the plan to use Rugged. Have you started yet? I have done some of them. Well, let's talk. <laughs> <laughs> I've been working with Rugged too, and I've got some. Okay. okay. So, could you really import and export would change to facilitate this? You would be going right and late, right? Yeah. Yeah, so you go to the marketplace, you download something from the marketplace, and you go to put it into an appliance, the import export process there would be interaction with Git, not anything else. Yeah. Is that right? It could be multiple. It could be I have this zip <coughs> and I just want to blow it out into a domain. So we would create the repo under the covers, put it in and make the initial commit. You know, or you can say just point to this git URL and we'll suck it in. Okay. I mean the, the options become a little bit more there's a lot more options once you yeah, get so when you go to the marketplace, you can actually download from the marketplace straight into your kit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The repository is that actually bring a download kit. Ideally. Yeah. Yeah. So in, in the marketplace, you get, uh, get remote. Yeah. Your kit just points directly. Exactly. When you subscribe get. to the marketplace, you have to give it your kit details. So anything you get from the marketplace will try to your kit. So I guess that's similar to what I'm, I'm questioning. Is if I'm doing all my development in a lower lab environment, is there a promotion mechanism so that I, I have my Git repository just for my development? Because there may be several streams going on in development, and then I want to promote to a certain stage level. Yeah, you point would to actually a repository. Or? You could either point to the repository, or you could actually export out the model, the current model, and then you know, like bring it in through the export input process. Actually, that's a beautiful use case. I mean, you you want to develop all this stuff in development. And, but there comes a time where like, I did all this work, I tested all of this, I don't want to copy and paste these across 12 screens, whatever that could use is. If that was a repo and you had it off of a branch, and you're committing into that, and then finally the time comes you want to push, that, that's the use case Git was invented for, at least for software, right? And Which and is text files. SVN, you know, I can go and get an, a, a labeled release and do my build against that, put it on the staging server, test it, and I know it's good. I didn't know if there was a mechanism to do something similar to that. Yeah, the, ready for my oh, yeah, that's a great use. I mean, that, that that's where the shine is. So that's a great use case. Yeah. Huh? When, do, when you say Git master, are you talking about GitHub or are you staging a Git it's master staging, yourself? Staging, uh, that's just a name. You're staging it? Yeah. I think okay. That's actually the guy that will be in charge. So you're not using an external Git yeah. map? Yeah, okay, great. Because that would fly in like a government secure environment where they want to have a closed network. Yep. So the git master is the 
one that actually manages the, the domain repository information in Postgres. It actually keeps track of uh, internal domains and external domains, and you know, like which are the domains that are actually uh, writable, and you know, which are the ones that are read-only and stuff like that. It also keeps the last commit information. In the Automate Explorer would actually, in one of the use cases, would be reading and writing into this one, and all imports and exports would typically be running from the git master. Is is this a new worker type? I think uh, there are a lot of questions, and so uh, I don't have all the answers. That is one of them. <laughs> Stop so, asking them now, please. <laughs> uh, actually, uh, I have a list of all of these questions, and you know, like we have to, as we play along, you know, like uh, as the design gels, I think we'll see more and more closures. And okay. Obviously, we definitely need new workers, and you know. Are you all so, ready to market? You? <laughs> <laughs> So the git slave was actually the one that actually was responsible for doing the synchronization and would read the repository information from Postgres. It can actually, if you are not using the commit shell, disable the automate worker rule for the appliance, wait for the existing automate workers to end, then synchronize the database, and then re-enable the automate worker for the appliance. And if you're actually, if we change it to the point where we can actually run with the commit shell, then you don't have to disable can actually run with the uh, existing commit share because that data is available for you. And uh, the Automate Explorer in this scenario would actually work in a, when you log into this particular git slave, it would actually be in a random game. The, the thought is that uh, Postgres were maintaining <coughs> the repository information. I thought we'd just let uh, the git repo manage those foreign connections. Now. They could, I think it's just an optimization. If okay. you want to see, like for like Jason was saying, for reporting purposes, if you log in centrally, you'd actually know which of the domains <coughs> and they have been last updated and so on. Oh, nice. So this is the question I think like, uh, Dan you're asking, like what the commit boundary should be. Right? So a commit boundary would actually be a single file change if you're trying to do maybe an instance or a method change. But uh, when you work at a domain level, Say if you wipe out uh, a domain or a namespace or class, it actually takes a whole bunch of files underneath it. Right? So you're editing a whole bunch of stuff. So when it's, you know, we need to decide uh, the commit boundaries, either they should be single file, multi file, or user configurable, or you know, like based on how many changes are being done to the system. So based on the commit boundary configurations, we can actually do the commit and uh, save the information. Maybe also. You would ask the user for you know if they want to put in a commit message so they can actually track what the changes were. So this this makes it sound like we're hiding Git from the user. I, I was under the impression that we were exposing Git and saying, do you like as as someone who's familiar enough with making changes to code, you would also maybe be familiar with version control systems. So make a change and be responsible and make a commit when you're ready. No, I think this is making the assumption that you know, like uh, the designer who's actually using this and uh, creating the models for his specific problem that he's trying to solve, he is not Git aware, and okay. we are actually providing the facility underneath. Okay, so this, it's, it's not just code; it's you know changes to the schema and main spaces. It's not just code, so. Sure. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm, I, was, I don't uh, think this precludes that. Yeah, that's what's stopping me. Okay, checking yeah. out that repo. If you love the repo, you can do the command line. So today, <laughs> today you can actually do that because since we have already segregated the domains out, you can actually play with the domain and you can actually store it in a repository, pull it down, and you know, like insert it back into Postgres. That's do, that you can do today. So these are the discussion points that you know, like uh, the Git server protocol is it going to be SSH, HTTPS? Should we allow for branching? And how often should we commit changes to the master? How often you know we should be uh, pulling down the updates from the connected appliances? So we don't have all the answers. I think we're just uh, starting the discussions. So I think if you have any input, I think we're 
Maybe we have to share the other day. What, what, port, what ports are going to be open for that? Uh, one of the thoughts is to actually use uh, HTTPS and have Apache serve up the files from the different repositories. We just do standard HTTPS, but I think HTTPS, I think it says it's a little bit slower compared to the SSH. So I think it depends which protocols we want to support. And, yeah, and you configure one of them you're considering, uh, yeah, you're also setting up different security. That's the thing. Aspects. What, what security aspects do we have to deal yeah. with? It's, it's not saying one's more secure than the other, but one of them you're setting up SSH keys, the other one you're doing SSL keys, and the SSL keys is kind of the client side service, it's kind of the direction we're going, so that might, that might be easier, even though personally I prefer the SSH ones. Yeah. So you know, one, one git master be a slave to another, so like we've got more than one region. Yeah, get us peer to peer. Yeah. So, like typically yes. in Git, you have a canonical source, mm -hmm. and then everybody else makes clones of that and keeps pulling from it, and you push to the canonical source, right? So for us, it's the manage IQ. It's GitHub.com slash manage IQ. We all agree that's the canonical source, right? Um, what, hit the terms master slave here are saying inside of the managed IQ like network, this one is the canonical source and everybody yeah. else is relating to that guy. But you know, from past experience, you may get um, you know, factions in Europe and the US who want to uh, you know, operate with inside their own domains and uh, you know, alter their own material and then share that material by direction. So the US domain comes read only to Europe and the Europe domain goes read only to America. No, I was going to say, maybe that's maybe that branching. That's How does that sort of thing work? I'm not sure it's branching. I think it's repos. It's repos. It's two separate repos, actually. Two repos. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's six or one half dozen. Yeah. Yeah. And then branching or repos. So that could be two domains, right? Yeah, two different domains. between the two. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. How much? But the beauty of it is you can set up like you can do whatever you, whatever you want to do with Git. Like it's all for a piece. No, it, 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 it's made <laughs> no, it's yes. because the answer is if you were your canonical source and then you went offline, yeah. Jason and I can still contribute back and forth. And then if you come back online, then we can contribute with you. The reason why you're canonical source is you're trying to avoid conflicts. And if everybody's at least getting up to date with canonical source, you avoid the conflicts. But that's again a business workaround, not necessarily a technical. And by the way, isn't branching what would allow the, uh, like more of the, uh, you know, the Dave QA, QE prod kind of workflow if it was, you know, well understood by the automate engine in the sense of, you know, here's go to this branch, you know, I'm coming, I'm telling you I want to run my QE side, just mm -hmm. run that. Good. Isn't that the answer to it? Yeah, that plus even, you know, you could use the comment shares to, like you can, each comment you can basically, you don't even have to really branch it, you could basically say, uh, somewhere in the database it says everybody in dev is working at this shell, uh, everybody in production is working at a different shell. Oh, that's like the tagging idea. It's so right, tagging, it but it's not get tagging. Get tagging, right? it's it's not tagging, get tagging right? is like a hard, it's a hard link, right? It's more like soft tagging where you're saying, I want this to be production right now. And that's just where it is. Yeah, it's not going to be one shot either, right? I mean, if you guys right. talking about having two, three, four repos, each representative. Yeah, There's yeah. going to be a set of shots together. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. For one shot per domain. Yeah. 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 That's a little messy. I mean, that sounds complicated. Yeah. It's like from the end user standpoint, and I think I, I understand well, but make that more of the branching to manage like cycles, just like what you guys do in well. It's it's messy because you know all the guts. Right? But you could easily present it as, take what I currently am looking at and yeah. make that. And then we under the covers know, oh, that's these four shots, took it together, blah, blah, blah. They don't have to know right. that. Right. <laughs> so it's how you present it. It's how you present it, but now I'm going to go back to what Mr. Blanc was said, and I love my, uh, my comment line, and, you know, then, you know, so it's how do I do that, you know, if I want to do it, not with the UI. Not with the UI, yeah, yeah. that's different. So, I mean, that's, yeah. yeah. You have to be real careful with it, you know, if you kind of let someone go, and start messing around with a master Git repo from the command line, and then they screw it up. Uh, we have to have some sort of recourse on that. Well. So, <coughs> that's not necessarily true. 
But that's like giving somebody direct access to Postgres. And they could do lots of wonderful things in there. Yeah, it's publishing guidelines, right? It's oh, starting with publishing exactly. guidelines and stuff like that. I mean, that's what people with Postgres. I mean, it's the same way. We say, hey, here are the keys to Postgres. Do whatever you want in there. No. Oh, oh, don't within these guidelines? Yes. Those aren't that weird. Oh, wow. Okay. I thought we'd say no, I mean, you can't tell people to yeah. you, you can tell people don't use the Rails console. Yeah. yeah. They'll do it. Still, they use the Rails console. <laughs> yeah, if you use the Ruby line, you may have the plug in there to get, and you may be doing it from Ruby line. Right. Not necessarily command. So yeah, yeah, sure. Right, right. Yeah. So there's so some of the other uh, points, you know, the rollback, uh, our back for our main model. The UI would have to change to actually show all these different shards and you know and manage the stuff. And uh, the single multiple appliances allowing for the editing of the model, doing the commits, uh, doing back to a specific commit, and doing a single commit. So those are uh, some of the points that I have. So the, the last one about them doing, <coughs> if we're not exposing it, how would something go to? Uh, so the you UI. Yeah. Still have one, yeah. Okay. Okay. And, and the UI would actually sh also have the ability to show you a history of you know what are the different changes that have been made to the main. Uh, end up being so um, I actually have a small demo about uh, you know the Automate Explorer using the file system as a storage for the automate model. So today, when you look at it, we actually have the UI, which goes through active record to actually get to the Postgres database. And it does a read write through the active record. So now, once we go to the file system approach, and all the active record stuff is gone, so we don't have active record anymore to interact with the file system. So some of the changes, uh, some of the <laughs> research that we've been doing is trying to figure out uh, how much uh, changes would actually be needed to, uh, you know, like support the file system by duplicating some of the functionality that is there in Active Record in some of our classes that work directly with the file system. Once we have uh, this working, uh, at least we have, you know, some ballpark idea about how complicated this thing is, and once we can get in and out of the file system doing read writes, we can actually just insert the git in between, and then you know we have most of the functionality. So for the past couple of weeks, uh, I've been working with Jason and trying to uh, come up with uh, some classes that will actually mimic the um, active record behaviors. So what we did is uh, we used the active model for doing the validation and attribute methods and naming and stuff because active model is uh, separate from active record and it provides many of the validation features we have. And uh, add the MIQA get here that's still on, you know, that's uh, still needs to be designed. And uh, having a MIQA model basis basically implements uh, most of the active record functionality and then have that be inherited or included with the MIQA namespace, the MIQA domain, the class instance, and the methods. So, So this is all red code, and I think like uh, if it breaks, you know, I'm not. Uh, oh, it's done. <laughs> Always works on the developer. Yeah. <laughs> so um, to show you how the file system looks like, uh, we have these uh, different uh, domain YAML files that you'll see. They're pretty small, barely like 200 bytes for the domain YAML, and like like, like all most of the YAML files are pretty small. And we have this uh, directory layout, which actually starts at the domain and then goes down to the different namespaces and eventually to the classes and instances. <coughs> so that actually mimics the behavior here. So you know, if you were to uh, 
if I'm one of these uh, edit priority of domains, we can actually sort these things up and down and it'll actually get saved. Full screen or something. Full screen I did. Have a lot of them. No, it's it's oversized. Hit the plus the plus the plus the green plus the blue. There you go. Done. right now are being read from the file system and one of the biggest challenges that we had was actually working with the IDs because uh, typically all the active record IDs are integers stored in the database. Uh, with the file system model, uh, they are actually paths. They actually point directly to, it's a fully qualified name within a domain of where the instance is stored. So I had to make a lot of changes in many places to take out the compression of uh, IDs that is happening in our code, in the control. So once uh, we actually make all of these things, you know, all these buttons in the UI working, we actually would have covered almost 90% of the use cases of uh, our active record. And uh, once we have that going, then we'll actually modify the, the automate engine to actually start looking, you know, working with the file system and then eventually <coughs> bring in the Git. So that is a plan for uh, the automated. Are we going to show the file system that it came? <laughs> yeah, we're we supposed to trust you. you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so here, I deleted that uh, test. That's that gone. That's gone. Wow. You, can change, you can change an RB file, I'm sure. So I see something today. Something was modified today. The dates were just the times were just the minute. Yeah. 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 yeah, the domain YAML. Yeah, the domain YAML would have been different. So I think maybe let me try uh, uh, creating a new instance. And uh, you copy something. This is why I have one. So I think if I were to add a new instance, So the MIQ provision complete actually exists. Uh, it's if I do an add. So what it does is it actually runs the validate methods and then basically tells you that you know that class is already in use. So most of these features they're actually coming from active model because active model actually has the validation block. In the validation logic right now is like a file exist kind of concept? Yeah, the, the thing is I'm trying to stay as active record as possible for now. Yeah. But I think eventually most of those calls will actually become a lot simpler because you know like it's just a path access again because it doesn't really exist. It's a lot cleaner. But right now the way it is implemented is based on a relational database where you actually follow the relations and you basically say that the class exists and then you do an instance. So I kept most of that code the way it is because I think there's a lot of use cases all over the place where we're using that. What if I wanted to return to the previous way of doing things? Not go down. 
So I'm happy to pass it through, but maybe I'm an anti tier type of right? no, um, Would it be possible to literally just take the file system mm -hmm. which is on the master and mount it to all of my other automated appliances and then have one? That way I'm a single master edit point. If I edit it on the master, it's immediately at the others. Would yeah. that still work? Yeah, yeah that would still work. Is that going to be uh, a concept that we want to push, or we definitely want to go around this gear push push thing? It sounds like the advantage of having Git is that you have multiple versions you can access at the same time, yeah. the same files. Yeah. And so if you're in the middle of processing, you're in the middle of doing work, you don't want to be changing out some of the classes out from underneath. So that's the whole concept between the SHA. You want one version. Yeah, I sort of get it. I just, yeah, I'm also thinking that I want something now. Yeah. Yeah, today you can actually do that. Yeah. Each domain you can manage on your own. You can actually have a, a, your own GitHub account. You can put, put the domains in there and do a periodic pull, and then just do a, a database input. Okay. You can do that. Yeah. But you're asking now if you can do the file system. Like how quickly you get the file system access? So yeah. So if you, if you took the if you took literally the, uh, the the masters file system where the AE data store is, and then you just mounted that to each other automation of files. In effect, you've got a single master distributed. So, so one important point, point, one important point <laughs> is that this this file direct file system access mm -hmm. could not be used in its form right now, because <clears throat> one of the things that databases give you is transactions. So you can, if two people modify the same thing at the same time, right? You can use transactions to make sure that they don't collide. Right. The file system, you don't have that. So if two people modify at the same time, you're going to collide. I thought that this could not be used in the file system form as it is. When we get to Git, then you could potentially do that because you could have two branches. I'm you not know, so sure that's, that. that's quite the case because Windows doesn't allow you to do that. To do what? But, uh, to access the same file system. It does have distributed locking where the Linux files are supposed to. No, but uh, I think uh, it's so a bit more of a very at any one time on the file system, so NTFS it is actually possible for the same person. Yeah, uh, but it's a bit more annoying right? because if you change the class schema, yeah. right, and then you modify the instances, they both have to be done in a single transaction. Yeah. So then, you know, that's guaranteed. Otherwise, if you were to able to edit the class but not edit the instance, you have a broken automated model. Okay. So this is, this is more for demonstration purposes that it, we've We've eliminated the active record model and are able to do all this from files. Right? Once you have that, once you're able to do that, then Git is a possibility. What are the performance implications of the I haven't measured it. Measure it. I think like slower, faster. We actually uh, were using, uh, like I tried using as much of the active record functionality that is there. So it still follows the relational process of, you know, like saying, go load up the namespace, then go load up the classes, then go load up the instances. Whereas when it's in a file system, it's a very simple compare because you just say, does the file exist and just glue the paths together. So the way I'm doing it right now, I'm making it, you know, as compatible to active record as possible. So I haven't uh, seen much of a performance degradation, but I think we don't have any numbers. But I heard you say that you expect it to be faster if you were to break some of that active record. Yes. So right now, I think if we were to go like a, a checking for like if an instance exists, it's a lot easier in a file system model. And even in a Git, when you're walking the comment tree, you basically say, does that location exist? And you don't have to check for anything. Else. And most of these uh, YAML files they're pretty small, they're actually hundreds of bytes. And like uh, Since we already squeeze out all the shared variables for instances. Well, that, that yeah. could be slow. Yeah. That could be, I mean, like if you do a RISE or FS or something like that, you can leverage that. I don't know what file system we're using, but potentially some file systems don't work well with a ton of small files. Okay. So, Does that have your question? Yeah, so I mean, that's a, you know, that applies to the base, but virtually that this model could apply to other content that users have to generate within manage IQ, like reports, policies, stuff like that, right? So, so 
that's his starting point. So. Okay, so REST API for our main methods. I'm seeing. I think Max is there, you just need to click up at the top. The curse is not there, but you, you click up at the top and you know, just push up to the top and click. Yeah. There you go. That's it. So the REST API for automated methods. So since we have added a lot of functionality recently on the REST uh, uh, API, we're actually thinking of taking advantage of those REST APIs for automated methods. And the key driver being uh, that today, uh, the automated methods run by distributed Ruby. So the methods have to be written in Ruby. If you had to support other languages, Know, the REST API would actually give us much better flexibility in doing that. In the past, we have actually done that where we have added support for Perl and in other languages, but uh, that went through uh, storing the, the workspace in the database. So I'll actually show you how that works. So the automated engine worker today runs as a separate process. And uh, it builds something called a workspace, which actually has uh, all the objects that are actually in the uh, that were in that particular resolution model. And it builds a graph of that. So that's what I'm actually depicting here: with these uh, three round boxes around uh, objects there. And then what it does is it actually launches up a DRB server, and the DRB process actually has the automate method which has a client piece and they communicate over HTTP and they exchange objects and you, know, you get a lot of these nice little things that Ruby has and none of the, the method really doesn't have to know that it's actually communicating over HTTP. Uh, but the problem is, you know, again, it, it's a Ruby only method. If you need access to the, the VMDB uh, models like the VMs and hosts and storages, they are actually accessed via the service model, which is also you know, visible to that particular uh, automated engine worker. So when we go the rest way, what happens is there is no DRB. So the automated uh, method is actually by itself running as a separate process. And, uh, then it actually talks to the web service worker which is running the REST server APIs. And it does not have access uh, to that workspace anymore because that's running in a completely different process. So one of the things that we could actually do is to actually use the database to store that workspace in its entirety. Then <coughs> have the method come in through the REST worker and you know, in modify that workspace or make changes to it, and then we'd actually read the thing back in once the method has ended. So some of the, you know, the plan is actually to add uh, a new AE type for REST-based methods so that we can actually 
keep supporting the existing, the DRB approach that we have. And uh, the new uh, AE patch OS method, the advantage of it is actually it will also trigger saving of the workspace and generating a unique token for the workspace that has been persisted. So this can be passed down by REST API, so the REST API actually knows which uh, workspace to pull out from the uh, Postgres database. This has actually been implemented previously, and I think there were some performance issues, so we'd had to work on uh, optimizing that. So back one, uh, or back two slides, I guess. Why, why do we need a workspace? I, I didn't even catch that. So typically what happens is that when the methods run, yeah. they need to interact with the object that was actually built by the automation process. Okay. So say for example, if you had uh, uh, an email method, and the email method, uh, the email object actually has a from address and to address. Mm -hmm. And when this method runs, it actually needs to pull those two things down. And so what it does typically is it basically says go get me that email object and from that email object get me the from and the to. Okay, why would you just create all of the email message on your client and you just send the whole object out <laughs> at once? I so mean, why, why, why is this object active on the server? Why not have it active on the client? Because both of these processes, they are actually running on the server. So the automated method is running on the server. It's running in an isolated. Uh, world sandbox because it's it's Ruby that's written by the customer, right? Right, right. But so it's it's written in this isolated world that has limited access to things like the VMDB object. We don't actually give them the VMDB objects. Right. We give them service models that say here are the things you can do with a VM, and it's kind of a loosely based on the VMDB object. And if you're using DRB, I understand that because you're kind of working with an active object on the server. Right. It's chatting and you're doing that kind of stuff. But if you're going to the REST model. Locally, you compose the email, and then you say ship it. That's if you're only accessing things that you need from the VMDB, right? The workspace, what it actually is, it, the way Automate works is all those names and classes and namespaces, those are definitions. And then at runtime, we resolve that into runtime objects that are in memory, right? You still may need to access those objects in memory, but they're all on the server side. They're not on the Automate client side. Previously, we used DRB to just say, okay, pull it out of your memory <laughs> and give me it right back. If you talk through REST, REST doesn't run on the same box. It may not even be in the same physical appliance. Right? It may be somewhere else entirely. And that's the, the big challenge right now. I just think if we were to implement this in JavaScript on a browser, we wouldn't REST. When you say REST, in JavaScript on a browser. But okay. okay. And then if that was the case, Usually you download the objects or the data you need. Mm -hmm. You do the manipulation you want, and then you ship it off to the server. But right. maybe that's too much of a lot Correct. of change So the data and the objects you need in this case are the automated namespace, which is currently in memory. Okay, but the, the JavaScript use case, you actually downloaded it, and it's in memory on the client. You do the manipulation on the client. Mm -hmm. The server, the state is not still on the server. They're not remembering all the stuff you're doing. Mm -hmm. And you ship it off to the server. You're saying we would ship the whole automated workspace through every REST transaction. We go back and forth with the server every time we want to do something. It seems like the whole World Wide Web works somehow. I wonder the current isolation is based on uh, safe levels or? Yeah, it's using safe levels. So and it's going to be something also an opportunity to actually isolate it properly. And well, that's why we're talking. That's one of the reasons this discussion yeah. even came up. Yeah, it was okay. getting rid of all that safe level stuff and not having to worry about isolating Ruby in that sense. So some of the discussions around this working on persisting the workspace, reading and writing the workspace from the REST worker, and uh, reconstituting the workspace for the automated worker when the method ends. So those are, I think, some of the issues that uh, we have encountered so far. There might be more. The other small thing that I have is, you know, like breaking up the automated engine as a gem. Uh, the automated engine actually is responsible for, uh, like I said, reading the automated model, instantiating workspace, sort of objects, composing memory objects in the automated model, then execute the methods, execute the state machines. So, some of the
of the advantages of putting it into a separate gem would be and it's easier to maintain modular isolated testing. And most of the stuff today actually uh, for automation, uh, for the automated engine is in a separate uh, lib directory. So there is pretty much um, isolation that way. I think we'd have to gemify it and make sure, you know, like uh, uh, it works with some of these uh, issues that we have, like uh, working with the MIQ delivering from the queue, especially when, uh, when you're trying to do a retry, you know, you can put things back into the queue. There's also issues about uh, excluding the service model. And uh, the other thing is uh, registering the built-in methods uh, that don't use DRV. So because those methods are actually executed uh, internally. So they would all have to be, uh, once we put it into a gem, they would have to be somehow exposed or registered. Why do we have this? Well, that's <laughs>